Welcome back to the GP Productions podcast. Okay, welcome back to the show and I've got a great guest on the show today currently in transit coming from his own podcast joining me today Mr. Rory McAllister one half of the Highlanders that you'll probably remember from WWE how are you doing man I'm doing good my friend how are you man doing good doing good listen as I said off camera thanks a million for joining me today man really appreciate it, taking the time out oh she's not even a question brother you're good yeah. Listen, man, I suppose like what we'll do is what I normally do is um, growing up, when you were growing up back in the day in Scotland, was wrestling something that you wanted to do? Um, no. <laughs> if the answer be real, no. I had no, I had no desire to be a wrestler. Um, I did, however, want to be a boxer um, from a young age. They're not to say I didn't watch wrestling, you know, like I... Uh, I watched all the, the, you know, Sunday morning with all the British wrestling on and stuff. You look like Big Daddy, you know, Giant Haystacks, Pat Roach, all those guys. And I enjoyed watching it. Um, but from a young age, I'd always, you know, I'd, I'd always liked boxing. And then as I started growing older, you know, guys like Mike Tyson came into play, which really kind of caught me on it. I started looking at the history of boxing and fell in love with guys like Joe Lewis and, you know, all those guys. And just that was that was my direction. Or I thought it was going to be at some point, anyways. But no, no, wrestling was never a, a thing I, I seen as being my life. <laughs> yeah. And did, did you do any training in boxing then, as a young man, or what kind of sports did you play? I did not. Well, I mean, I played football with everybody else back home, you know. Um, but I did train in boxing. I uh, trained with a guy called Charlie Kerr um, in Glasgow, uh, and he was a fairly well-renowned. Um, boxing coach at the time, but, you know, Donny Hood, who was, I believe, the uh, European Bantamweight champion, was in there with him, and, but yeah, I trained him with him for, for, for a while, actually, before I moved, and I started training with other people over the country. Mm -hmm. And w when you first started wrestling, did you wrestle any time in the UK before you moved over to Canada? No, no, I had, uh, I never did. I had, uh, I had delusions of grandeur when I was younger. You know, yeah. like, uh, apart from wanting to be a boxer, I just wanted to be, for want of a better term, I wanted to be famous. Okay, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Played the guitar and everything else. Um, I'd put my finger in a few pies, as it were. And, yes. Uh, you know, none of them really came to fruition. And, but I'd always seen myself as wanting to be something different, something a wee bit better, you know. And uh, one of my ventures had failed. I won't go into that. But I get okay. back home, and uh, you know, I just I was kind of feeling bad for myself, to be honest. And I get back to my apartment one time in my flat. I should say I've been here too bloody long. And uh, <laughs> my buddy, was, my buddy was chilling out there, and I was like, "Fuck!" I was soaking wet from work. I was freezing cold. And I'm like, "Man, this can't be my life." You know, oh, this ain't this. This isn't what I see myself doing forever. It's just this nine to five grind. And he's like, oh, yeah, what are you going to do? And Monday Night Raw was on the TV. And I was like, I don't know if I can cuss you or not, but, you know. You can say whatever you want, man. I was like, fuck it. These guys seem to be having a good time. You know, I'll, I'll do that. I'll, be, I'll become a pro wrestler. And he started making fun of me. And uh, he told my other friends, and they made fun of me. And then my family made fun of me. The guys at work made fun of me. So six weeks later, I sold, uh, I sold my car gave up the lease in my, my flat and uh i left and i uh, found a wrestling company here come my kids so i don't 
<laughs> so that was kind of where that was kind of where I could, kind of things changed for me. You know what I mean? Um, once I made that commitment to become a wrestler, it was absolute for me. I'm like, you know what? If they're going to make fun of me, they're going to start talking shit. Um, I'm, I'm going to go. I'm, I'm going to start doing this, and I did. Um, yeah. Moved over to Canada, and you know that's where. Well, that's really where everything changed for me, you know. And why was it Canada that you picked at the time? Did you know people over there? Ah, there you are. Yeah, I was just saying. Why? Why did you pick Canada to go as initially? Well, because sorry, moving here. But shut up. It was. It seemed to be the place to be. You know. Uh, I, 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 when, I, when I thought about when I thought about wrestling and everything else, I thought about you know guys like the Hart family, Benoit, Jericho, all those guys, and I'm like, well, that seems to be the place to be. That seems like uh, like wrestling central, you know? Yeah. So I didn't see my dog get sick I'm back home. <laughs> so I, I literally just I found I found a training school and. Uh, I was that moved over, man, and day one I committed myself fully. That seemed to be the smart choice, you know. I wasn't going to go there and do it half assed. That that wasn't going to be, you know. Uh, when I left and I sold everything, I left myself with a situation that if it failed, then I, I was going back to nothing. Like I had nothing. That was always going to be uh, what fed me to do it. Is if I uh, if I did quit, number one, I was going to go back to everybody making fun of me. Uh, and, and number two, I had nowhere to live. I had no job. I had no vehicle. I had nothing. So Canada at that point seemed to be ground zero for, for Rory. Yeah. And it, and it seemed, um, obviously it didn't take you too long really to get even some dark matches on with the WWE. How did they come about? Um, <laughs> the funny thing is that because I had no visa, I had no visa to Canada. I had no visa to the U.S. Oh, my gosh, Dad. Oh, sorry. I had no visa to the U.S., so I had to keep crossing the border. Okay. Um, back then, this was before 9-11. So back then, you could spend, like, uh, it was like $6, I think, for a 30-day visa, and I'd go back and forward. Um, and in between training, you know, we're obviously we're working independence at that point. We're going all over Canada, all over the U.S. Uh, we got some inroads and uh, basically just started harassing WWE uh, talent, which at that time was uh, Dr. Tom Pritchard. Yeah. And worked with Tom Pritchard up in like Vermont and New York and Connecticut and all those places. So I called him up and I said, hey, we're ready. And he's like, you sure? And I said, yeah, man, we'd, we'd, we'd like to kind of come and, and, and take a wee look, you know? So he brought us in for the first one, which I believe it was Montreal. Um, but then after that, we just lied to him. We're like, "Hey, Tom, we're in, uh, we're in Long Beach, California, close to you guys." Oh, stop by. We weren't. We were still in Toronto, or we'd tell him yeah. in, you know, Seattle, and he was good there, or we were in. So we just lied, and he knew. Tom knew the story that I had nothing, you know. That I, I mean, I was living thirty bucks a night, you know, three nights a week, just trying to survive and eat. So I think he kind of took a wee bit of pity on us at, at the start, but then he started bringing us in, and he gave me a match right out the gate. Um, I believe it was with Rhino, I think. Um, yeah. but just persistence, you know, and, and the fact, like I said, I had no safety net. So I'm like, fuck it, what did I have to lose? You know, the will either say no, and then I'll keep doing what I'm doing anyways. I classed myself as a wrestler at that point because I was wrestling every week. I was traveling. I was constantly wrestling. I was meeting new people, so... I guess at that point I was kind of a journeyman. Me and Robbie were, you know. Yeah, and they—they they obviously. What was the decision then between? Was there anything to do with them with you guys joining OVW then at the time, or was that just something that happened after these dark matches? <laughs> no, what actually happened was say hi to Sophia. Hey, uh, what I, actually uh, happened was uh, we were doing all these matches, and I just kind of get me and Robbie kind of get tired of it. And uh, I pulled I pulled Johnny Ace aside one night, and I was like, "Listen, man, this is great. You guys are paying me two hundred and fifty bucks a night, which is more than I've ever had. You know, you're bringing us in. I mean, it was almost like a job. You know, it was every it got to the point where it was every few weeks that we were there. 
I says, but I want a job. You know, I need to be able to hang my hat on this. I need to be able to settle down roots. And uh, he looked me and Robbie square in the face and went, I'll tell you right now, we're never going to hire you. And right. I was like, well, follow up, need some feedback, brother. And he said, uh, he's like, listen, man, I could go to OVW. I could take two guys, put them in kilts, and call them the Highlanders, and the crowd would not know the difference. He, at that point, we had like, had a wee kind of Fu Manchu mustache, and Robbie was clean. He, you know, he looked real nice with a business haircut and a wee goatee yeah. like everybody else in WWE. And he's like, nothing stands out. And I said, so what does this mean? He said, I'll tell you what, I'll give you three months. Go away for 90 days. Don't show your face. Don't call us. Don't do nothing. He says, come back then, and it's your last chance. Kind of just bring something, you know? I believe at that point we were in uh, Providence, Long Island, or uh, I think it was. I'm not sure. I could be wrong. But uh, we drove back all the way back up to Canada, and uh, I don't think we said more than a couple of sentences. We were both just kind of shell-shocked, you know, that all this work, and it was about to be shot down. And it took about 24 hours after we got back home, and I called Robbie, and I'm like, here's the deal, man. Like we we got to go back with something that they that's, that's going to catch them, something they haven't seen in a long time. I went, they obviously been a Scottish tag team that's new. They've had Scottish people that had Piper. I said, yeah. we have to go in there, and the first thing people look at when they see us is, all right, those guys are Scottish. So, unfortunately, <laughs> here in uh, the, the great old uh, US of A, um, when you say a Scotsman to them, they still – a lot of people still anticipate kilts and everything else and brave heart fuck yeah you know yeah. Like the most ridiculous thing so i say to robbie i'm like that's how we're going to go we'll, we'll go in there as as you know these neanderthal almost um ancient scots i says we'll wear the kilt with a wrap around it like pugilists you know some fur we'll put it on there so it looks like it came fresh off the mountains and uh robbie's like well you can't really grow your hair and i said fuck it beards just massive beards. Nobody in WWE had a massive beard. And oh, fuck, at that point, I couldn't even tell you who was the last person, really, you know? Yeah. So, all the gear that we made, Robbie made the boots. But he actually made the wrestling boots. I made wow. the first rows. I made the further around the boots. I made the, 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 the wrist ties. I think it was for a total of $20 Canadian we made all of the outfit for. <laughs> and uh, I, I said to Robbie, I'm like, this is what we wear when we go in. You know what I mean? Like we go in there as Highlanders and then they will take us or they don't. He was all for it. He was throwing in his two cents on everything that we had to do. And uh, that was it. We, we, we rolled the dice. We went all in. And so we showed up at uh, Fuck, I couldn't even tell you where it was, mate. I honestly couldn't tell yeah. you. It's somewhere in America. And <laughs> we walked in and Johnny Ace is like walking by and he, he stopped dead in his fucking tracks. And Did he, he recognize you? It took him a second. It right. took him. And he stopped, he looked his dead in the tracks, and he went, Highlanders? And I went, all right. And he's like, stay right there. And he literally ran away. <laughs> Fucking Robbie looks at me and he says, uh, we're just about to get kicked out. And I'm like, all right, I guess so. <laughs> and he came back with Vince. And uh, Vince is like, hold on, Sophie. Vince is like, did you show up to my building looking like that? And we went, yes, sir. And he's like, Johnny, put him in a match. And he's like, I want to see how they do. So he put us in with, uh, I believe it was the Miz and Matt Capitelli. Right. God rest Matt Capitelli. What a beautiful yeah. soul. Yeah. And uh, Robbie looks at me and he's like, all right, what do we do? You know, he's trying to think <laughs> of thoughts we could do. And I'm like, let's just kick the fucking shit out of him. Let's just go in there and just, you know, show them, show them we can shoot, show them we can work, show them we're not nervous, show them we're not scared. And Robbie was all about it, you know. Um, so we went and did the match, beat the piss out of them, which was good because if you beat somebody up and they beat you, then it looks like they actually won something. You know what I mean? I've never been a big fan of, hey, you, you guys are working enhancement talent, and then you go in and destroy them and go, yay, what did you just do? You did fucking nothing. So we went in there and made them work for it. 
and uh, Vince loved it. He was he was very happy, and uh, yeah, we get a call probably less than forty eight hours later that did a contract for us both. Yeah, so you guys like were obviously super committed to this from you leaving home. You wanted to go for this yeah. from like uh, from Robbie making the the gear and everything like that. So did they stick with the initial gear that you guys made then as well? Yeah, we haven't stuck with yeah. everything. Um, Robbie, by the way, just not just me giving up a country and everything. Robbie had a very very good job, um, doing very well for himself and his family. And when we got together, Robbie also gave up his career and everything. He was making very good money. He had a young son at the time, Trey. Um, we're talking young son. He was probably two or three years old. And he sacrificed everything just based on the fact we could do it. Um, but no, we got to w, we got to OVW. We weren't there very long. And um, we kept our gimmick there. I was, I was not very – I loved everybody at OVW, but I was not very happy with the way it was panning out. Um, pretty much from then, I wanted to go home. I'm like, fuck this, this is terrible. We were given some really bad advice. We were, it, it just, it, I didn't enjoy it at all. Um, but we did this skit. It was, like I said, all, of, all those guys were friends. And I love them to this day, I still talk to them. Um, but Punk was running rough shot over everybody then. You know, he, Paul Heyman was running the show. And uh, they'd cut me and Robbie, they'd stop using his in-ring talent and we were just doing these backstage stupid segments because we could talk and do stuff on the fly. And uh, Mr. Kennedy, good old Ken, he was looking for yeah. Punk and he threw into the back and he's like, uh, have you seen Punk? And I cut this ridiculous promo. Like, just ridiculous. And, and, and broad accent. I'm like, there was a punk to the left and a punk to the right. The violence was fucking disgusting. And I did all, and he went and said, went, oh, he's right over there. Just, And it was so stupid. Uh, we got a phone call from Ed Koski the next day. And he's like, loved it. Loved it. We're bringing you guys in as these funny. And I'm like, oh, fuck. Yeah. <laughs> you know? But that was how it started. Basically, they brought us in based on a couple of stupid promos. And the fact that they knew we could work, regardless of what was yeah. happening in OVW, they knew we could work. So yeah. that was when they brought us in, full gimmick, um, and then tried to take that away from us at some point. And, you know, I was not having it at all. I was, I was not happy with that. Yeah. In, terms, in terms of the promos then, when you got to WWE television, yeah. were they literally handing you guys scripts or did, you, did all your creative freedom go out the window at that point? Um, yes and no. They did hand the scripts, but then they let us loose, you know, to Ed Kosky's uh, testament. Um, there was a lot of stuff that, that was just kind of us on the fly, just fucking around, you know. Yeah. Over to, to uh, Liberty Island and stuff like that. That was just all us, um, cutting the promos and meeting everybody. And the same when we went into Times Square um, and then when we were in Titan Towers, that, that was just us just fucking having a laugh. I mean, like I say, I don't know if either of us were extremely happy with the company um, from the get-go. Um, it really wasn't. Sometimes you chase a dream and you don't realize what the reality could be. And I don't think both of us were, were that, you know, swept away by it. So they gave us a little bit of creative freedom, yeah. Yeah, was was the reason that maybe you didn't like it as much as when you got there? Was everything too planned all the time there, or was that yeah. the, was that the real problem compared to working on independence and various yeah. other places? Yeah, big time. That was the hardest, and especially with having so little ring time at OVW. Um, it was very hard for that, you know. That I don't. I was never trained to call everything backstage. You know, I was trained by some real old school guys, and I was never trained. I mean, you know, I was trained by Smith Hart, Walter Von Erich, you know, and a handful of other these old timers, you know. Yeah. And very hard adjustment for me to be like, okay, so I'll take three steps back, we'll do this, I'll shoot you in. But that, that wasn't how I, I worked at all. I couldn't, I never liked it very much. But then we were working with a team at the time, and Cade Murdoch, that that's all they wanted to do, every single step had to really? be planned and everything else. And then we're trying to adjust to this comedy gimmick also. So there was a lot of variables there that, that just made it for, I just wanted to wrestle, man. You know, there was nothing else I wanted to do. 
Um, sure, tell me with the hard cameras, I'll give you the finish, but that's it's, it's not just dependent on what you want. There's a lot of stuff going there. And hindsight should have been a little bit more forceful um, yeah. with what I wanted because it was my career, you know. And, and I gave some of that up just because of where I was at and everything else. So, yeah, yeah, that was a lot of it. What was I know you you said initially when when you were talking to Vince McMahon and he loved the way you guys showed up to the arena and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Do you have any stories about working with him hands on? I did. I never had a problem with Vince. I yeah. was kind of funny. You know, there was times that I'd actually sat and drank with Vince backstage. I came back from vacation one time and had a big bottle of brandy and we sat and drank it. Um, I never had an issue with the man at all. Um, he liked. He liked the fact that we would always go to him with stuff, you know. Um, he yeah. knew before like, when we were working like Rhino and Tajiri, we'd worked William Regal and Dave Taylor and all those guys. And those were guys that, you know, did not like to call anything. So he knew we could work. Um, but then we had some good times too, like on our debut night where we were sitting in back and we were slapping his arse and stuff like that. And he was always a good <laughs> guy. I, uh, I know he's been through some controversy right now, but I like the fella, you know. Yeah. Yeah, no, I like I always like hearing like I've heard both sides of Vince from various different guests and like my opinion on him is like he's done like ma- like massive things for the wrestling business and that'll never be taken away from him. I find it very hard to be mad at a guy that took me I was living in a car, man. You know what I mean? Yeah. We were a freaking escort driving all over North America and whatnot. Uh, and this man took me to you know, I think six months after signing, I bought a house. I put in 50% on my house. You know, my cars, my motorcycles, all this stuff. Like, how can you get mad at a man that allowed me to do that? I went from eating fucking, I had cat food one time for a meal, you know what I mean, for a while. And then I could walk into any mall and buy anything in that mall. I can't get mad at a guy for that. Regardless of what happened in my career, that's not Vince's responsibility. That's mine. Sure, there's politicking, but. That's my career, man. Like, I don't give anybody else credence on my career, just me and Robbie. Yeah. Um, in terms of WWE, people always say locker room leader and they mention someone like The Undertaker. Did you see any signs of that when you were there? Was he kind of keeping people together back there? I was on the Raw brand mm-hmm. for the most part. Now, one thing that a lot of people don't realize is that me and Robbie were working Raw, SmackDown, and DCW almost every week. Yeah. Um, great for the fucking payday um so yeah i mean i got to work with undertaker in that capacity but for me being a raw guy you know we were we were squarely under mr cena you know john John was the face of the company and everything else he was for the most part a great locker room leader um there were some instances that we never really agreed on of you know but john was always open to conversations about it um but, you know, Hunter was still active then, too. Sean was still there. So I was basically under John and then those two. But then I had worked on SmackDown. So Taker was, he was a good dude, man. I don't know. I can't think of a bad thing to say about that guy. And I'm sure there's a million things that, bad things that people have said. But again, dude, my, my, my career there was, I didn't ever really have a beef with anybody. Yeah, I heard he was a good guy to have a few beers as well, a few whiskeys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, over here, it's that fucking bourbon stuff. It's, yeah, it's not the same. Yeah, it's oh, fucking horrible. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, was in, I was in America in April. I found it very hard to get a decent whiskey. Obviously, me being from Ireland, I'm a Jemison guy. Right, right. Nah, I'm, a, I'm an Oban guy. Single malt. Yeah. Oh, I, well, it smells nice. like home. You know what I mean? Like, like Scotch. You know, they ferment it through the peat. So when you crack the bottle open, you can actually smell. There's, there's a lot of fragrances that remind you at home a wee bit, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Dur- during your time there, and like, I don't want to dampen the spirits here, but um, the Chris Benoit, obviously that thing happened in between when you guys were there. Like, how how shocking was that? Like, I never heard your your perspective from everything on this story. Like, and how did you find out about it? And what was the mood like around the place when all this came out? It, I like Chris a lot. I had a, a lot of really good conversations with Chris. Yeah. Uh, and 
I watched somebody not that long ago told me to watch. I don't know if you guys get it back there. It's uh, Beyond the Ropes or something they call it. Or yeah, uh, it's um, Dark Side of the Ring. Is that what Dark it is? Thing. And yeah, it says to watch it, and I was like, I don't really like that shit. And, and I watched it, and it was a Chris episode, and I'm sitting here with my kids, and I just started, I just broke down. We were. Chris was always a good guy. I remember him. He'd stop and get his son. We'd go on overseas tours, and he would stop and get his son just to bring him to the show to spend just an extra few hours with him, you know. Mm-hmm. And, uh, we were we did the thing for Vince. Vince was supposed to get blown up in a limousine. I don't know if you remember that. Yes, of course. That happened the week before, which was fucking the mental, week, really. The week before, and we were all supposed to be there for Vince's funeral. And I believe it was Corpus Christi. And I was hanging out with Edge and, and Viscera, and uh, somebody came up to us. I can't remember who it was. It might have been JR, because we, uh, we had black shirts on for the funeral, and everybody wanted us to have, to, he wanted to, everybody's got to wear a white shirt and black tie. So, well, fuck. So we jumped in a rental car, and we're heading here, and I'm sitting beside Viss, and he's like, Rory, I, I, he's like, I, I never like this. I don't like this, man. He's like, anytime we do some kind of angle with death, death shows up. He's like, I don't like it. I remember playing his day, him saying that. Wow. And probably we, had, we went back to the arena, and uh, I just remember uh, Malenko came out, and he went straight to Vicky. But for, like, Vince had called us out of the ring, and, and he got up into the ring, but before he said that, Malenko came down and, he went over to Vicky, and I, I've never in my life heard a scream like it. Like, she just, like, un- inconsolable, man, you know? And uh, we knew Chris had missed the pay-per-view the night before, obviously. He's a big guy, he's a big big name. Uh, yeah, you know, very right? uncharacteristic, yeah. We were we were under the, the impression that his family was sick and everything else. And Vince is in the ring, and he's like, hey, so... We did a wellness check on on Chris, and everybody's dead. And dude, this we're in the middle of an arena here. And there's regulars and lightning and pyrotechnicians and everything else. And you could have heard a pin drop, man. Like I think we all breathed in, and nobody breathed out for about thirty seconds. And I was sitting with Randy. And he just kept shaking my shoulder. He just kept pushing my shoulder and pushing my shoulder. And he's like, he's like, let's go fucking smoke. Let's go fucking smoke. And we went out to have a cigarette, which we shouldn't do. It's nasty kids don't do that. <laughs> and dude, both of us just broke down. And then Lillian showed up and she kind of fucking lost it. And, you know, it wasn't long after that, they said they were going to do a tribute show. They said they could either stay or we could go home. And, uh, yeah, 99% of people went home. And there was me, Robbie, Taker, Hunter, I think Shane Helms. I could be wrong. So I say to one of the guys in the building, I'm like, here, man, there's $50. Go buy some beer, you know, and we're just going to sit here and watch the show. And they had been recording people all day, you yeah, know, yeah. To, do, to do the sound bites and whatnot. And, and it was fucking rough. And I don't know what it was, and I didn't want to think about it at all, man. I didn't. I looked at Robbie, and I'm like, what if we're doing a podcast for a guy who just killed his fucking family? And I didn't want to think that, but how could you not, you know? And he's like, shut mm-hmm. the fuck up, man. Don't don't even say that. Yeah. And the next day, we're flying back, and I'm, I'm on the same plane as Randy. We're, uh, we're, I think we flew into Kansas City. And... Uh, Randy goes for a coffee and he comes walking back and on every screen in the center of the hub of the, the, the airport, it, you know, mm-hmm. murder, suicide, murder, suicide. And dude, I, I just, Randy just lost his shit. He literally just lost his shit and fucking ran out to the airport. He was home anyways. You know, I was catching the second leg. And that was kind of how that whole thing happened, man. Like, that was my, that was my experience of it, you know? Um, yeah. it, Tough on everybody because nobody wanted to believe him, and nobody did. And uh, 
but you kind of look back and like, people I was talking to, and then, you know, when I go in and I go, hey, Chris, what's going on? He seemed a little bit more withdrawn. And, and I heard that later from a lot of people that he'd become more withdrawn in the locker room. And then they immediately, and this is the part that, I don't know if this is something I'm supposed to talk, oh, who gives a fuck, I don't work with him anymore anyway. But, you know, they completely just deadlined the guy. Take yeah. him out of everything, take him out of everything, take him out of everything, take him out of everything. Mm-hmm. Here's my thing, and this is the same company that talks about mental health and mental wellness all the time. When they did Chris's autopsy, he had the brain of somebody in their fucking 80s with Lou Gehrig's disease. Well, his yeah. brain was... My rationale for it, what I can kind of get by, and what I tell a lot of people who always ask me, and you always get those assholes, well, he's a fucking murderer. His body physically did the act. His, there, there wasn't... Chris mentally that did that and I know that because I don't know what his relationship was with his wife but I'd seen his relationship with his kid and it was beautiful man you know and so for me I look at it like physically yes mentally no yeah. uh, I think a lot of people that, that knew me would probably think the same way but I don't know I can't speak for their opinion yeah I'd say that will probably go down as probably the darkest day you worked there I'd imagine yeah um yeah. Yeah, not even close, man. Yeah, but if we flip it back again, what mm-hmm. is like? What is your proudest moment of working there? I've got, I've got a couple. First one was, um, obviously the, the the deep friendship that I ended up having with uh, Roddy Piper. Yes, uh, I ended up having a real beautiful friendship with that guy. Um, my first time going back home after all the bullshit I dealt with in North America, and I mean, there's a lot of bullshit, trust me. After all that, my, my first WWE overseas tour was back home in the UK and Glasgow, my hometown. Um, and it was me, Flair and Piper against the Spirit Squad. And uh, he gave us, him and Flair, Flair wore my kilt. I still have that kilt that Flair wore, actually. Um, it's hanging up in a shadow box in my wrestling room. Um, he did this amazing introduction, and I came out, and the crowd just, bah! it was the wildest thing that I just ended up breaking down, obviously. You know, I had not been home at that point in like eight years, seven years. Wow. Um, so there was that, and then I think, and Robbie agrees with this, probably, my camera's all over the place, I'm sorry, mate. Um, oh, man. Probably my proudest moment in WWE or my most memorable, we were in Durban, South Africa. And it was me and Robbie against uh, Dave Taylor and Paul Birchall. I actually, believe it or not, just spoke to Dave Taylor about this yesterday online. We were talking about this. And we were in Durban, South Africa, and the weather was brutal. It was an outdoor show, but it was a massive money show. Yeah, and the guy that had paid for the show was getting worried that he wouldn't get the full show in, so they put Cena on early, um, in hopes that if you know things took a shit, the crowd still got to see Cena because at that point he was huge. Yeah. Uh, so the hell is off, and then they're like, "Okay, the weather's holding. Like Highlanders, your main event." I'm like, "Holy fuck, this is main event in a WWE show." Okay, cool, and. The I think the, the the African people understood the history with the Scottish and the English. Yeah. So Dale and Paul Birchall, you've got two prominent English wrestlers. Now you've got the only two Scottish tag team there. And dude, we did everything. This match was probably a good 30 minutes long, all on the fly, completely on the fly. Obviously, Dave Taylor was the ring general. What an amazing worker, dude. Probably the most undersung wrestlers in this country. That's, he's worked here for so long. Yeah. But an amazing gentleman. And what a match, dude. Like, we blew the fucking rafters off that place to the point where we got back onto the crew. We went from the ring straight onto the tour bus. And uh, Cena and, and uh, Shawn Michaels were like, what the fuck did you guys just do? <laughs> just had fun, man. <laughs> you know, it, that, was probably, that was probably the greatest moment, man. I, I loved that. That was my first and only main event. <laughs> yeah. Um. When you look back on things then, I know people ultimately talk about when Robbie went on to TNA and all that yep. stuff that happened. Um, do you remember when you talked to him after that and did you guys go back to the arena together 
after that happened and what was the reception like? Did you get no, any heat well, from it? I didn't. Um, I was, yeah. I'd been hurt. Um, I was at the, the go home show for Royal Rumble. That's where my pack and my blew my shoulder it completely. Yeah. So I had this kind of tear that, uh, uh, Cody just had, but I blew my shoulder at the same time. I needed to full reconstruction and everything else. And we had to cut away a half of my pack muscle. Um, so I wasn't even going to make it to mania. But what happened was I do canvas art. That's nice to some of my art back there. I don't really care about this. I do yeah. canvas. I like to paint. And uh, I got a phone call from Stephanie, and she's like, hey, you know, my son at that point was only four weeks old. I had my surgery two days before he was born. And Stephanie's like, hey, man, we're doing a, uh, a charity auction. We're doing it at WrestleMania. I know you like to paint. Would you like to come down and try and sell some of your artwork? And I'm like, well, if it gets me done there, man, that's cool, yeah. So I packed up the family, we go down there. And I get there, but I'm still treated like a talent, obviously, even though I'm hurt. And uh, Vince did his big grab the brass ring speech, which was just absolute fucking horseshit, to be honest with you. Um, because you can only grab what they're willing to hand out. Yeah. So he did that speech, and then he brought up the whole thing. He's like, nobody goes to I get it where we're at, you know, our competitors here running shows, nobody goes to the show. I didn't intend going to the show, and I don't know why, but at that exact moment, I, I pretty much knew Robbie was going to go, only because I know he'd been having, he, he wasn't happy there either, and especially with me gone, you know, he did a couple of good matches, apparently a really, really good one with Ron Killings that got him noticed, but at the same time, like, he still got his family back in Ontario and they were going through a couple of problems there and he'd asked for time off they told him no so I'm sitting in the in the hotel room with my boy and I was feeding him talking about feeding him you get that in a second um, talking about feeding him uh, and I get this phone call and I pick up the phone it was fucking Johnny Ace again Johnny Ace a piece of shit by the way um, <laughs> I heard <laughs> oh absolute dog shit I'm so glad he get fired Anyways, um, he starts going off. Your cousin was just seen on live TV for TNA and blah, blah, And I know it probably wasn't the right time. I started fucking dying laughing. Well, I am barely laughing on the phone. I said, I'll meet you at the bar. So I go down to the bar. Taker's there. Finley's there. Uh, Johnny Gase comes over to talk to me. And he's like, you don't have a problem with this? And I went, Johnny, I don't know what I can tell you, man. I've got one arm right now, and I've got a kid. I'm like, I'm just trying to get by, you know? Um, so I sat there with Harry Smith and, and, and his sister, Georgia, for a little bit, and we had something to eat and a drink. And eventually, Robbie came back, and uh, did Fit lost his shit. Fit was irate. Now, obviously, you know, I understand where he's coming from. Yeah. You know? He came down here and like he made a lunge and Taker actually stopped him and went, Dave, calm the fuck down. Because Robbie had the balls to do what he did well. He did it in purpose or not, and I'm almost certain he did. He had the balls to do that and he walked right back into the bar to face the music. You know? He didn't like try and didn't do nothing else. He walked right in there and fit went out and Robbie stood his ground. I mean, fucking Robbie's be that shit. I've punched Robbie in the face before. You know what I mean? He can take a shot and he stood there to take a shot like a man. And I think Taker really respected that from him. You know what I mean? And he, he's just like, the fit, calm down. He's like, the boy fucked up. He'll pay his penance. He's like, leave him the fuck alone. Hmm. And uh, that was it. I went back, you know, back home to do my rehab and everything else. And, uh, yeah, can I go from there, man? That led up to our last match, which I was really happy about. <laughs> yeah, so you were you were happy at the time to to get out of. Was it just trying to get out of there and just continuing wrestling elsewhere? Is that what you wanted at the time? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it, man. I just wanted to wrestle again, you know. And I remember because the last match was in Richmond, Virginia, and I got up that morning. And at that point, I'd been off work for ten months. I'd been yeah. rehabbing, but I hadn't just been off work for 10 months. My son was born weeks after I had surgery, and I had, well, two days after, and I had raised him this whole time. I did every midnight feeding. I did, you know, anywhere we went, he was with me. I had to rehab, he was with me. 
Uh, and I was rehabbing with the Cincinnati Reds, the baseball team here. Um, and he was always there. He became my shadow, you know. And I remember um, getting told I had to go back to work. And I'm like, all right. And I went into his bedroom and I leaned down his crib to give him a kiss. And I just lost it. I didn't want to leave him. Yeah. So we get to Richmond and the first person up to me, Shad, come on and up, you know. And I go fucking hunt from Shag. And I look. Man, I miss that guy so much. And uh, he said, we're working tonight. And I went, this is probably our last match. And he's like, oh, you guys are good. I mean, well, there's heat there. And then there's other stuff there. And, um, we did the match. And, the, you know, sure, it was, they, they put it in as a kind of squash. And Shad didn't want to do it either. Neither did Jay. Yeah. Um, I even called it a little bit early, actually. I'm, <laughs> I'm like, fuck it, I'm done. And uh, I, I called the go home like two minutes too early, but who fucking cares? Um, then we kind of went from there, man. And I, I, I knew regardless that we were done. Johnny had been lying to me for months, months at that point. You know, the whole time he'd call me up every week, twice a week. Well, hey, how are you feeling? How's everything going? Can't wait to get you back. We're going to put you in a program here. And blah, blah, you guys will be fine. And I'd say to him, I said, well, Johnny, what about the whole Robbie thing? Oh, man, don't worry about that. We'll deal with that later. And just bullshit me. Don't smoke up my arse. You know what I mean? I later found out um, that he was the one behind it all. He was the one trying to get his shit canned and everything. Apparently, Vince and Steph weren't even really into it, but he, it, was, it was all it was all him, you know. And uh, a week like we get back, and the week before we we're due to fly out back to TV again, I got a phone call, and he's like, "Your cousin's was on the other line. I just let him go." And I didn't I didn't, I didn't give him a chance to say shit. And before he said that, she's I looked at my my girl at the time, then my son. Because we were driving to get pictures taken. And I says, yeah, I guess I'm done then. I guess I say, I'm, I'm going the same way as Robbie. So I don't know what he's going to say. He's probably going to fire me anyways. I don't know or if he was going to say, you know, I, I have no idea. Um, but I didn't give him a chance to say shit. And that was it for me, man. Like, yeah. you know, we but, were... Would you have stayed without Robbie there? That's the question. No. No. So it didn't matter what he said. Mm -mm. No, just on pure principle. Um did mean I went over there, and I, I literally had what I had in my pocket, you know. And here's a man in, in fucking Derek Graham Couch, Robbie McAllister, my heterosexual life partner. That <laughs> that dude took me in his home, fed me, got me work on farms here or there. We trained together from from fucking dawn till dusk. We traveled together. We did everything. Now, I don't think for a second he was going to say, hey, we've got a job for you anyway. But if he had said that, no, there was no way I was going to go with it, Robbie. Not for not for one second, man. My morals are too strong for that, you know? And uh, I, I wouldn't... Money has not been... Although I need money, it's never been my guiding force in life. And yeah. uh, that's not, I'll let that come between me and my cousin because I consider him blood. I love him like, like family. Yeah. And to this day, you guys are still always together and doing stuff what's what's life in the present day like for you now what are you up to these days well i raise her brother is now 15 years old almost and he's just a big horny fool and then i've got <laughs> you one right here that you met earlier say hi, hi. she's all nervous Shite. um <laughs> so i get that now i've got a career in aviation i uh you know, I, I'm, I run, I help run the uh, flight you line. like a minion. Okay. Um, I help run a flight line. I'm happy with my life. I'm I'm a single father with two kids, you know, and and, and I love it. I love my life. It gets a wee bit lonely sometimes being so far away with home and nobody else here. But, you know, I'm blessed, man. Robbie's up in Nova Scotia. He's doing great things up there, man. He's he's actually really stepping. He, he stepped away from wrestling for a long time. He just got back into it few years ago and he's doing really good man you know he's up there pretty much running rough shot over nova scotia and everything else so life is good man i talk to robbie all the time we're always laughing and joking and you know we had some stuff that we we both had a couple of issues with each other that were unsung and hadn't been still love them you know but we had a couple of issues and we we sorted all that out a while ago so, no, dude, he's, he's still very much a big part of my life, man. Always will be. Could we ever see the two of you guys 
in that ring one more time. Robbie's in stellar shape. Um, I fucking apart from a little grey here, I haven't changed a bit in yeah. the past five years. You know what I mean? Like everybody says to me like, "You look the exact yeah. same." I mean, it's that fine Scottish skin. You know, I don't let it see. I don't let it see sunshine, so I don't wrinkle. Um, <laughs> if I, would, it, I would, I would absolutely love to do something with the Viking Raiders because everybody keeps doing that whole thing. I mean, first it was, you know, when the Wyatt family showed up, they're, they're ripping you off your gimmick, which they actually ripped off Robbie's gimmick completely. Um, Robbie had pitched that gimmick to WWE for quite some time before they gave it to uh, Bray. Bray, yeah. He was he was working that whole gimmick over in the UK with Dixon, um, doing all the Butlins events and all this other stuff and working shows over there. And so he was he was kind of like uh, it was like I think he called himself like Bayou Bobby or some shit, you know. Mm-hmm. But it was one hundred percent his gimmick. Um, and then, and then the Vikings, of course the Viking Raiders. Yeah, I was just going to say as well. Put up and you know everybody's kind of saying, "Honey, you need to sit okay." Everybody's saying obviously the similarities and everything else. Yes. Um, and you know I think those guys are amazing. I really do. I enjoy watching them work. Big Todd. I mean Jesus. I think he, I think he's Ivar Todd, Todd Smith, and I mean for such a big fella he can float a bit like a butterfly. Oh, yeah. So if I was if I was given one last run, I would like to go in there and do something with him. You know, a, a handing of the That'd fur. That'd be cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a handing of the fur, brilliant yeah. man. Just before we wrap up today, um, you were recording your podcast earlier. Do you want to tell us about it and what it is you guys do? Yeah, uh, it's actually <laughs> it's three guys in a bar. I yeah. I actually I actually turned it on earlier, and I I was just coming back from work, and the only little snippet of fifteen seconds I heard was you talking about setting up an OnlyFans. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> so dude, we ultimately what the show is it's, it's three guys at a bar, just yeah. drinking and having fun, and being guys because that's the thing now. It's not okay just to be a, to be a fella, you know. You, you've got to identify as something, and you've got to be something, and you've got to be sensitive to this and everything else. And like I tell you, I see it in the news, I hear it Do, from certain people. Here's something you might find interesting, uh, fellow Scotsman Graham Suness got in a bit of hot water over here yesterday for you a do? comment for yeah for a comment he made on TV in front of a woman that was there. They were analyzing the soccer game yesterday and Suness turned around and said that was a proper man's game and people are giving out that he said it was a man's game while there was a woman present so that's the world you're living in Jesus Christ let me ask you is there 22 men on the field yes that's a proper man's game then isn't it do you know yes. what I mean the whole thing we went so far liberal it's not even funny and that's pretty much what our podcast is it's okay to be a fella having a beer with your friends and talking shit because there's yeah. a difference talking shit and being political. I don't want to be political. You know, I don't want to talk about anything else. If somebody wants me to call them a lawn chair, they identify as a lawn chair, you're a fucking lawn chair. If it makes you happy, I don't care. But I, I doesn't stop me from being me. You, you can't change that. So the show is me, uh, my friend Matt, who's a Air Force veteran, and then my buddy uh, Nathan, who's, who's a comedian slash musician. And it's just us sitting there drinking, you know, and, and talking shit. And it's a lot of fun. It's called the Wood Podcast. It's for wake, urinate, and dominate. So it's W U D. Because you don't have to be one of those fucking crossfitters or, you know, somebody that wants to walk across the nation to dominate your life. You can fucking do it regardless of what you do, man. You can dominate eating a fucking McMuffin if that's what you choose. <laughs> <laughs> and what I'll do is I've got to pop the link of your podcast underneath this video and I'll just say thanks a million Rory for your time today man best of luck with everything in the future thank and you. thank you so much for your time man I appreciate you brother you take care of yourself thanks man see you mate